Let us pray. Holy God, those places in our lives that have stones today, that are dry and hard and shriveled up, we pray, O oh God, for your spirit to sweep over us. That we, like John Wesley, might find our hearts strangely warmed with your presence. That we might find your power flowing through us. And that everything we do brings honor and glory to you. In your name we pray. Amen. You know, as I was thinking about the text this morning, the whole living stones thing was kind of wandering upon me. And, and I have to tell you, this is, was my first thought about this whole scripture. You might remember this from memory time. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. Do you remember that? The wise, you can join me, built his house upon the rock. And the house on the rock stood firm. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. And the house on the stand stood still. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up and the house on the sand went splat. Do you remember that? You remember it? And, it, it, and in many ways, that just covers the whole text. You've had your sermon. Thank you. Have a good debate. <laughs> However, there's more to it. You know, how do we... How do we become this living stone? How do we build upon the foundation? How do we build upon the rock? And you might not know this because I didn't know it until like 10 years ago when I first became the pastor here. And somebody in the congregation made a big point of saying, now this Sunday is Heritage Sunday. And we got to be sure we celebrate it. And I'm going, Heritage Sunday? Did any of you know today was Heritage Sunday? Yeah, some of you did. Some of you did. But Heritage Sunday is like when we acknowledge John and Charles and, and our heritage of being United Methodist people. And I was just like, oh yeah, I guess um, that's important. And I have to tell you, I now confess because it is important and I understand this year how important it is for us to acknowledge that. And hopefully when we're done with our time together, you'll agree. If not, you'll tell me so and that's okay. It is also the Sunday before Aldersgate. Now, if you're new to Methodism, you might go, what is Aldersgate? Is like a, you know, what is that? And so I'm going to talk to us about today, about Aldersgate and our heritage. And, and we're going to talk about how we can look back at our forebearers and how they were living stones they were actively building the kingdom of God in their community. And maybe there's some things that we can learn from them that helps us become living on fire stones that build our community. Now, some of you like know nothing about John Wesley, and John Wesley was a preacher's kid, and I'm raising some, and I know it's a challenge, and I've always heard about PKs growing up, you know? because they were raised in parsonages and they were raised in church and they're either angels or they're the opposite. <laughs> and, and they either end up loving the church or hating it or, you know, so John Wesley was a preacher's cat, um, kid and his mom, like, Every week there was a day where she instilled theology and doctrine and faith to him. I mean, he not only got Sunday school and church, but he got mom. Okay? So if there was anything about the Bible, about God, he was fully, osmosisly consumed by it. Right? 
And sometimes what happens with preacher's kids is they go into the ministry. I don't believe my children are going to do that. I think they'll do other things. But he did. And he felt impassioned to be a missionary. And he came over to the colonies at the time to witness and evangelize in Georgia. And he crashed and burned. His ministry in Georgia and in the colonies, that's what we were called many years back, was not good. He was pretty bad. Matter of fact, he almost got, like, ran out of town. It was bad. So he gets on a boat to go from Georgia back home to England. Total failure. Questioning, what am I doing with my life? I don't know how to do anything else. And on this trip, there were a series of storms. John talks about the third storm being really powerful. And he talks about how it started at noon. And it just got worse. So that at four, it was really bad. And at seven, it was bad. Even worse. And there was a group of German Moravians that were traveling on this boat. And, and John noticed that they were different than the other people on the boat. They were like really gentle, they were really kind, they were really humble, they were very serving of one another. They were different kind of people. And so at 7 o'clock, the storm is raging, and John goes to hang with the Moravian German brothers and sisters. And they're singing a psalm, and John's words are this. In the midst of the psalm, the sea broke over, split the mainsail in pieces, covered the ship, and poured in between the decks as if the great deep had already swallowed us up. I never imagined it being like that. I get the vision of the Titanic, you know? Everybody's thinking they're going down. John goes on to talk about everybody on the boat, except this group of Moravians, is like screaming. They're scared to death. You know what those Moravians do? They continue on with that psalm. John is thrown by this. And so he goes to the leader of the group and he says, weren't you afraid? And they're like, no. Weren't even your women and children afraid? And he said, no. And so the guy, his name was Ogletree, of ever trivia night. John went to him, and John said, why weren't you afraid? And, and he said, do you know Jesus Christ? And John, you know, Sunday school church, mom, from in, infants, you know what he says? I know he is the savior of the world. Is that not a perfect confirmation answer? He says, true, but do you know he saved you? John said, I hope he has died to save me. And then he said, do you know Jesus? And John said, I do. But he then says in his journal, I fear those were vain words. One of the things that I think is really a question for us in our day and age is do we know God? Do we know Jesus? Do we know the Holy Spirit? So that in life and in death, we know God. See, the Moravians weren't afraid of that storm because they knew God was with them. And whether they lived or whether they died, God was with them. Nothing would change in that state of being. And so that plants the seed for John, and he's worried, and he's feeling like, ah, oh, I can't do ministry, I don't have faith, I don't know how to answer these questions and live them out. And so, so he goes to people, and he's like, what do I do? I don't have faith. And you know what they say? Um, preach faith till you have it. I think in our contemporary terms, we say, fake it till you make it. 
And so John is consumed. He doesn't want to just do the Sunday school church mom theology. He wants a real living encounter with God. And he feels incomplete. And so he's part of a group of guys that get together and they do this really hard work every week they get together. They meet, they pray, and then they say, so how is your soul? And they don't do this little facade of saying, oh, I'm fine, good work week. They say, no, I'm dry today. Or I don't feel connected to God. They're honest and transparent before one another. And then they talk about the sin in their lives that they're struggling with. And you know what? They pray for one another. Not only in their meeting, but throughout the whole week. God, lift up brother so-and-so. And so on May 24th, John says, he wakes up and he sees this scripture. Those are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that you shall be partakers of the divine nature. What he hopes for, he wants to encounter God and he sees at morning the promises of divine nature. And he goes to this thing, this group, and somebody is, believe me, believe me, reading Martin Luther's preface to the epistles of Romans. Now, I don't know about you, but I've had to read a lot of commentary, and I don't typically find it spiritually stimulating. If anybody wants to read this, I can. The first part's only six pages. But it has language like, um, you know, in first place, we must acquaint ourselves with matters of language and understand what Paul means by these words, law, sin, grace, faith, righteousness, flesh, spirit, and similar terms. Otherwise, we shall derive no benefit from reading this epistle as a spirit welling within you. I mean, we're talking language of Luther, about Romans, about defining sin and righteousness. Is that spirit warming your heart? I don't know how it did for John, but it did. As he's listening to somebody read this, the thing he has been hungry for begins to burn within his gut. The thing that he's been worried about, do I know God? Do I know Jesus? begins to be answered. And in it, he finds himself becoming on fire. When I was studying Methodist history stuff in seminary, one of my friends called him OCD. And he was always worried about his assurance. He was always worried about, was he saved? Would he be with Jesus when he died? He was worried about that. And if you think about it, John Wesley was worried about salvation. But he was. And he claims that Aldersgate moment was the moment when she knew. When church was no longer church, which it wasn't the ritual, it was real. I remember, believe it or not, I was writing a new uh, Old Testament paper, take home midterm exam. I was in the house by myself, and I don't know why. But as I'm writing about David and his kingdom and all that stuff, I'm confronted with the concept of hesed. And hesed means that 